Hello and welcome to Connect. I'm your host, Randy Shabilo. On today's show, we'll have Jan and Jackie with the television show Staying Wild on City TV. And as always, we'd like to connect with you. Follow us on Facebook at ConnectYXE, catch past interviews on YouTube, email us at connectyxe at gmail.com, or leave a message at 306 665 3796. They're small, 13 pounds, you can do it warming. Come on. Wildlife rehabilitation. There's always a bit chaotic. Just everybody stop moving. Come on, don't you dare crawl out of that. It's always exciting. Having to problem solve and figure things out. That's bad. That looks old. Every animal that comes in has a story, both heroic and tragic. I don't know if we're coming back from that. It's a hard job, physically and emotionally. Things live, things die. Sometimes we make mistakes. If we didn't have wildlife rehabilitation, they would die. It's your final journey. We take in the injured, we fix them up, and we put them back into the perfect habitat where they belong. We have a new season of a new wildlife show. Coming out this year, we have Jackie and Jan with us. Thanks so much for coming to the studio today. Thanks, Thanks for, for having, having us. us. We want to jump right into it and talk about where did this come from, Jackie? You mentioned a little bit of history behind all of this. Yeah, we brought that up because being in the studio here is kind of a flashback. And when I used to work here um, many years ago, and I heard, I used to do interviews with people out in the community. And I heard about this incredible woman who did wildlife rehab. And I was like, wildlife rehab, is this a thing? Had no idea it was a real thing. And I went to Jan's house to interview her. I remember going into the basement. She sized me up, first of all. She sized me up as she'll will. She said, can you carry that bag? And I said, yes, I can handle this, ma'am. And we went into her basement, and there was a baby skunk under, like, an incubator lamp and birds all around. And I was just flabbergasted and found out more about Jan. We became friends. And then I said, you are a TV show. This is a TV show. It's got to be a TV show. So I started shooting footage with her, and, and we dreamed of doing a TV show, and it took many, many years, like eight to ten years, something like that, before we actually off. got it off the ground. Yeah. yeah. How did it uh, start with you just in terms of you had to start somewhere? Yeah. Did you have a vision for so many segments, and, and what would that entail? It was a totally new world for me because I came from a community television background, and I worked there from... 20 almost years and that's my reference for television when it came to pitching a tv show and a concept i had no clue what to do so i have this wonderful partner also with community tv background named george sugranis i still can't pronounce his name properly and uh we got two other uh producers l mckeckern and hannah hermanson also with very good histories with with tv shows and um and they taught us basically Here's how you pitch it, how you develop it. We pitched it to City TV, and they showed interest right away, and uh, they gave us some development uh, money, and we then we worked on that concept. And then Jan gave a call and said, I have a lot of bats. Do you want to come shoot some of that footage? You want to tell them about that? Oh, the, uh, the rink in Unity guy was getting a new roof, and it was wintertime, and they knew they had bats, but they didn't really know how many. So the roofing company, thankfully, specialized in removing bats, and so they removed several tubs worth of bats and brought them to us, which was quite horrifying because we usually get them one at a time, and they were about 400 in these oh, bins and so I said this might be a really good time to take some footage. <laughs> That's right. So we brought cameras and uh, the camera operator. There's bats flying through the air. It was incredible. It was it incredible. Was traumatizing for me but yeah. yes. And I think City TV watched that and said, yes this is a kind of crazy stuff that they do every day that they just do. That's part of their jobs but to an outsider it's like shocking, stunning and amazing to watch. And so I think that that's what really got us the green light. And they said, yeah, we see the merit in this, and 
let's go for it. And so we had to develop a TV show for the first time. It was incredible. It was a real roller coaster ride. And it was amazing. And the show's amazing. They've so, done a fantastic job. So what is it that uh, you would look for in terms of the animals that you do have? Is it just kind of, let's phone Jan? Or how does that happen that you had the rehabilitation skills and knowledge to do this for the community? Oh, my history is um, I've loved animals all my life. And at one point um, I was living somewhere and I was volunteering at a nature center and they said, you would love wildlife rehabilitation. And so I just sort of fell into it like a vat of hot oil <laughs> and, um, and got completely covered and fell in love with the process and eventually moved to Saskatchewan and said, hmm, I'd like to keep doing this. And so at the time, the government wasn't actually giving out permits. You have to have permits to do this so it's not just that you kind of love animals and want to do it you sure, have to yeah, know what yeah. you're doing and then get the right permits and everything and so I eventually got my permits in 2005 and um, we started taking in animals and we had taken in about 20 animals and by 2010 we had, were up to about I don't know 250 300 animals right. um, operating out of my house in my basement my garage the skunks were in the garage for the husband's you know marital sake <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah and we just built some pens in the backyard and I have to say that by 2015 we were up to 650 animals and they were starting to get stacked all over the basement and it was just it was not feasible and so we looked for another site that we were able to find in the Sutherland area beautiful piece of property um, with a really old house and so I took a year off of my day job because believe it or not I was still actually working full-time and I renovated that property and turned it into a wildlife rehabilitation facility on the inside of the house and it has taken us from 20 the summer of 2016 until now um, and we are still building pens um, so as we get animals in and as we grow we just kind of keep building for the animals that we continue to get um, and so I knew we needed an aviary and a squirrel pen. And then we were starting to get more skunks and foxes. And so we built the skunk pen and the fox pen. And just last summer, we built the porcupine pen. And wow. now we're planning for what we are going to call an aquatic mammals pen. Because in 2017, I raised a little baby beaver, but I really didn't have the right setup. And this past summer, and then nothing. And so this past summer, we got in an otter in June and in September we got in a second otter and they are a one-year commitment and so we are overwintering those otters in what is supposed to be the raven pen and we dug in the pool and we did the the filter system and it was a fantastic opportunity for learning because we learned everything that could possibly go wrong and uh, really good learning curve and so now we're going to build an aquatic mammal facility. It's going to have a, a pool and it's going to be heated all through the winter. They're going to have access to water and all sorts of fun things to be able to run around and create and do. And so we're going to try and build that this summer. So it's it's been a growth process. I'm hoping that's as far as we grow. Um, that's my hope. But um, we'll see. Um, but we, yeah, so it's, yeah. How, how does an animal come into your care and well-being? Is it just people find them. off somehow? Or, uh, so people, uh -huh. um, it, you know, it's amazing. As soon as they hear that you love animals or know how to take care of them, they were starting to come almost before I had my permits. People were calling me and saying, I have this baby bird that fell out of a nest. What do I do? Mm. Um, and so I was already running interference on the phone. Um, and so once I got my permits and I was able to take things in, random people would just find me. They might call the zoo and the zoo would say, oh, we know this lady over here that could do this. Now we're very very well established and so if you google you know injured bird Saskatoon we would pop up on your Google but we also um, get referrals from veterinarians from the university college vet um, from anybody and everybody that you can think of brings us those animals so is there a, a size limit or a weight limit or I mean there has to be there are some can't parameters show up with a yes. giraffe or something because <laughs> <laughs> well, well that would be a non-native so. animal that would that would be definitely okay. whoa. Yeah. um we take in native animals generally yeah. although we do um unfortunately people do oftentimes show up with um, pet rabbits or cockatiels or budgies and we'll take them in and then transfer them to the appropriate rescues organizations um our size limit is we're in the city and so I don't do deer 
bigger. Um, so nothing bigger than, than really nothing bigger than a fox. Um, there are certain limitations on our permit as well. Mm -hmm. um, in the province, we aren't allowed to rehabilitate dangerous animals. So coyotes, bears, lynx, bobcats, those kind of things off the table. I'm, I'm just astounded by this. I mean, the show itself is magnificent, obviously going into a second season. Uh, Jackie, what can we expect? this coming season. Can you share a little bit about season that? Season two is, I have to say, a little more emotional than season one. I think, and, and, and I cried a lot in season one. I'm a crier and I cried. <laughs> I might be out of Kleenex this time. Um, because each episode usually features, we try to follow like two animal cases. And then so Jan's leading the charge and trying to save these animals. And you know, as Jan herself has pointed out in an episode, about half the time it doesn't work. Um, they lose a lot of lives and, and the, to me what's so astonishing is not just you fall in love with the critters, you know like the, the, the show opener or the season opener is about Stinky Winky, this little baby skunk that comes in, his eyes are still closed and he's the only skunk that comes in. And in order for a mammal to develop properly, as I understand from learning on the show, um, they need connection. They can't just be left in a pen alone, so they need connection and, and touch. And so Jan is basically mo mom, skunk mom to this little guy because he opens her eyes, that's who he sees and Stinky Winky, that's mom. And so she has to somehow help him develop properly, um, emotion, or like physically, but also um, not be behaviorally, not emotionally. And then somehow get him to release at the end so he can't be too attached to humans. It's these crazy juggling acts that they're constantly doing. And so there's a lot of human emotion in the show as well. And so there's a, Stinky Winky, the baby skunk, who I love. Um, this year, pelicans make an appearance, and they're shockingly interesting. Like, they're, they're truly fascinating. Like, a pelican on the water looks pretty big. On the table, it's massive, and their beaks are massive, and they're coated in parasites. <laughs> when you open their bill, they're coated in parasites, and the staff is just overjoyed at working with these animals. So you have these, like, really high joyful moments these really low moments when they have hard decisions and hard things happen and and that's staying wild like that that sums up all the stuff they go through every day but from an outsider perspective it's incredible I really think it's incredible we take in about 2,000 over 2,000 animals a year and that's been pretty steady for several years now um, and with luck we put about 60 percent of those guys back out in the wild Wow uh, when when would we see season two starters is there a, a day that it would appear what, yes. what could we I have it in my notes so I don't get it wrong it's Monday <laughs> March 18th at 10 p.m. Uh, it's on City TV Saskatchewan so you can whoever your video provider is you can look with them to see what channel that is but the great thing about City TV is they also put their episodes online so you can watch season one online citytv.com just look for shows and then look for staying wild and you can watch them all uh, in Saskatchewan right now we're airing nationally as well but that could change at any time so um, but yeah, we, we encourage people to watch the show and then check us out as well on Facebook and YouTube and all those sources because all the stuff we can't cram into the show, we put extra content there. And really, th I think one of the amazing things about the show as well is that you get to be up close and personal camera wise um, with, with the small cameras we put in the cases, with GoPros, the animals are gnawing on the cameras. Like you'll never see a badger in the wild, you know, maybe at a distance. And here he's gnawing on the camera. Like it's truly astonishing the kind of stuff we're able to capture thanks to Jan and, and, and show. So I, I, I encourage people to check it out however they however would, they can. Would they need any vet services uh, if, if something is if, if something falls out of a tree or uh, maybe gets bumped by a car or something like that? Absolutely. What, what would you do that? that that Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Whenever we um, are concerned about the structural integrity of an animal, we will take it to our local veterinarian um, who will do x-rays and radiographs on that animal so that we can see if there are broken bones and if those broken bones are likely to be healable um, or if we need to take them somewhere for surgery, those kinds of things. So absolutely, we work very closely with our veterinarians around all of the medications and, um, and all of the animal's care. Would there be situations like uh, maybe eggs in a nest that somebody might find in a field? I know there's always apprehension about you shouldn't touch it, but how do you know when and, and oh, ask Jan. Ask Jan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so those are the kind of questions that we always say, maybe call us before you touch them. 
Yeah. Um, it could be that, you know, mom is just out foraging for food and is waiting for you to leave her nest so she can go back home and sit on those eggs. Um, and there are ways that we can kind of walk you through, you know, are the eggs cold? Are they warm? Were they covered? Were they not? Um, we get we get thousands and thousands of calls. The phone doesn't stop ringing once it's baby season. Um, and so it's not all just the baby birds fell out of the nest. Sometimes they'll call us and they'll say, I have this little bird and it won't fly and I think it's broken. And very often um, our typical response is, is it kind of orange in front? Yeah. Does it have spots? Yeah. That's a fledgling robin. And they are like typical teenagers. They jump out of the nest yeah. before they can fully fly. And so they're going to hop around on the ground for about five days. So maybe don't let your cat out. Monitor where your dog is at times. Oh, sure. Um, and things yeah. until it can actually fly over the fence and get away from these animals. So we are fielding tons and tons of calls that way and really assessing every single situation. Um, as the call is coming in. Do people donate to the organization to help food or things like that? We actually rely on donations. We don't get any government funding. Um, sometimes we get summer student grants, but that certainly doesn't cover the costs of our food that we have to buy from the United States. Special mammal food, if you can imagine, you can't just give them cow's milk, so we have to get skunk formula and fox formula and squirrel formula that I just brought back across the border. And, um, and so that is hundreds of dollars. And the vet care is also on top of that. And then all of our birds have to eat insects. And a we go through over 100,000 mealworms a week in the summer. Um, so we need a lot of donations um, of particularly just financial donations so that we can buy the food. If you want to buy mealworms for us, that would be great. Um, but most people just say, mm, I'll just give you the money to buy the mealworms rather than buying the mealworms. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and that's wonderful because, yeah, and we're going to be building the aquatic mammal pen this summer, which is going to be a huge chunk of change. Um, we're going to get it right the first time. I have talked to to literally dozens of other rehabilitators about this process and they all say I did this and then it didn't work I did this and then it didn't work so I'm learning from all of their mistakes so we can get it right the first time I can't thank you enough for all the work you've done thank you for bringing it to television and all of us to watch uh, and I appreciate you both coming down and uh, best of luck to you thank you thank yeah. you so much thanks for having us we can't keep up with their feedings. Not fast enough. I'm a little stressed about this little guy. The infection is gonna happen so much faster in a little baby. He's going to be one lost little puppy. The center is absolutely filled to the brim, but there is not a single other skunk to be seen. Hopefully we get some friends for him soon. And he desperately needs a community that does not involve humans. That's our show for today. I'd like to thank our guests, Jan and Jackie, from Staying Wild, the show on City TV. I'm your host, Randy Shabilo. We'll see you next time on Connect.